message is brought to you by Ven Moody and the Worship Center Christian Church, where we are committed to honoring God, unifying communities, and building people. We hope you enjoy this message, and thank you for supporting our ministry. All these books are the same. If I've read one, I have read them all. Financial independence, does it really exist? Debt freedom must only be a dream. Investing, not my money. I mean, do you know how volatile the stock market can be? I need something different, something different than what I've tried in the past. But what could it be? We're starting a, a, a brand new series this morning that I'm excited about, and it's called Different. And I want you to, to open up your TWC app because your message notes and scriptures are right there. If you, if you don't have our app, it's free. Go out there, download it really quickly on any one of your mobile devices. There's so much out there in terms of free resources to continue to help you to grow and to engage the Word of God and just to, to live the kind of life that God desires for you to live uh, long after Sunday morning is over. But I want you to open your app and follow along with me as we start this new series. Uh, February, um, we always focus on uh, the issue of stewardship. We have our financial conference uh, that is next weekend. And, and so I want to I open up this new series entitled Different. And I first of all, before we go to scripture, I want to start off, the, the Lord has convicted me in a great way, and I want to start off by apologizing uh, to you. And this may not necessarily be for our guests. Guests, God bless you. We love you. But this apology more so is for our TWC family. I, I owe our TWC family an apology because for many years, I want you to hear this, I danced around this issue. For many years, I danced around this issue of what does the Word of God say on, on this subject of finances and stewardship. And I danced around it because uh, whenever I would talk about it, uh, it's interesting how I would see people kind of put their finger up, you know, that old traditional finger, and, and they would just tip out. Or I would see individuals um, when it was time uh, for us to give to the Lord, and they would make a beeline for the door. Uh, and, and I would see all of that, and because I never wanted our church uh, to be stereotyped, what I would do when, when it was time for us to deal with this issue, we preach on the whole Bible every year, but whenever it would come time for us to deal with this issue as a church and for me to teach on it biblically, I would, I would really dance around this issue. Because one of the things that I know that's so unique about our church is that we have a church um, for people that are new to the faith. We have a church for individuals that uh, maybe have grown up in the faith. But our church is also very attractive, and there's a, a grace on our church also for individuals that maybe were hurt um, in a previous church experience, and, and they drifted away from God, but they sense the authenticity and the integrity of our church, and, and the Holy Spirit has led them to come back to the Lord through this ministry. And so because of that, I know that this is a sensitive issue for a lot of people, and, and what I would do, honestly, honestly, what I would do is I would just dance around it. I would dance around it. And as I was praying and preparing, the Lord really, really, really dealt with me. I don't know if you've ever got a kind of spanking from the Lord. I don't know if you've, if you've ever not fully been in the will of the Lord and he's dealt with you. It is not comfortable. And so I want to start off this morning by apologizing to you. And the reason that God dealt with me is because... This is the number one issue for so many people. When I tell you it's the number one issue, uh, when you do surveys, when we do surveys every year, um, when I sit down and, and pray for individuals and counsel individuals, even when they go to our licensed um, and professional counselors, the, the number one issue that everybody wants prayer for, that people want uh, to see a counselor for, in some way, shape, or form, it comes back to finances. And so the irony is, this is the number one issue for most people. But at the same, on the same hand, this is also the issue that nobody wants to talk about. Did you follow that? It's the number one issue of need. It's the number one issue where most people are hurting and struggling and often silently. 
We look the part, but we are struggling in a great way, and we don't want anybody to know it's the number one need. But at the same time, it's the number one issue that nobody wants to talk about. And we've had, we've had I mean, conferences and crusades, and I mean, we've, down through the years and history of our church, I mean, we've had amazing men and women of God, and, and it's amazing that when we have, like, big evangelists or big musicians and they come, people are lined up to get in the building. You can't, you can't even get in the building because people are wrapped around in line trying to get in. But then it's interesting when we have a financial conference. The attendance pales in comparison to those that we know are really in need. And so this is a big issue. And I owe you an apology because for many years I danced around it. I didn't want people to say that our church is just about money because we're not. We give so much away because that is the heart of our Father. But I didn't really want to deal with it biblically because I, I want people to like our church and I want you to bring your family and your friends, and I still do. But I've been so convicted because the Lord has said, you know that this is one of the biggest areas of need for so many people, and, and it will never change if you don't really teach on it. Amen. But I want you to get this. Not only is this a big issue for people, but I also want you to understand that this is one of the biggest issues for our world and for our country. The USA Today in December put out a statistic, and it was a survey results, or stats that they had found based on research, and here's what, what it said. It said that nearly 70% of people in America, that's about 67% exactly, uh, but nearly 70% of people in America did not have $1,000 saved in their bank account. USA Today revealed that. Almost 70%, regardless of color, regardless of where you live in the U.S., they said that nearly 70% of people in America did not have $1,000 saved in their bank account. Then it went even deeper and said, and an additional 44% could not put their hands on $400 if they were in a dire emergency. This is why this series is called Different. Because if you follow the world's way and continue to not do it God's way, that is the outcome. You're not going to be where God would want you to be financially for not only your life, but for your children and just for your future. And beyond the current standing. This is not a political statement, but I want you to hear this. Based on where all indicators are pointing, the Affordable Care Act is probably going to be repealed. This is not a political statement. Doesn't matter if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat. Here's the problem with the Affordable, with the affordable Care Act being repealed. All indications point to the fact that that's where we're headed. 20 million people got access to health care through the Affordable Care Act. Now, even if you don't like it, and I'm not a big fan of all of it, there are some pieces in it that I really don't care for. But the number one reason for financial ruin in America today is lack of affordable health care. Meaning that if they do away with the Affordable Care Act, and we don't know what's going to be replacing it, we don't know how many people are going to be covered with it, but if 20 million people lose health coverage, and you go through a major medical event, and you don't have savings and things in order, that will wipe you out. The number one reason for people filing for bankruptcy right now in America is because they don't have adequate health care. Oh, you're really quiet. All right. I didn't think you were going to make noise, but let me share this with you as we go to the scriptures. There's a chart that, that the media team is going to put up, because here's the other reason that this is a really big uh, thing. There's a chart that they're going to put up, and it's a chart that shows the economic cycles of America and really the world. But, but our economy is cyclical, meaning that it goes through a peak, and really every five to seven years, sometimes six to eight years, we'll go through, after that peak, we'll go through what's called a correction or something far worse than a correction is a recession. Something far worse than a recession is a depression. And then we go back through a recovery period. This is the way that our economic system works. Here is what is coming. 
Please hear me. We have experienced eight years in our country of amazing growth economically. We are overdue for a correction or a recession. What that means is interest rates are going to go up. Inflation is going to occur. We are overdue for it. And if we keep going along the way that we've been going for the last eight years and there is no correction or recession, we are going to look eerily as a country, we're going to look so close to the, to the way that the country looked before the Great Depression in the 1940s. Are you following me? So I want you to hear this. Inflation, interest rates going up, it's coming. It's coming. It is coming. And when a recession or a correction happens, and if you are not where you should be financially following God's method, it's often us in terms of people that try to do it the world's way that have the biggest struggle during those times. Now, I say this to you because it shouldn't scare you. Because the truth is, the Bible is very clear that when we do it God's way, regardless of the economic conditions around us, you won't just survive, you will thrive. If you know your Bible, do you remember Joseph? When Joseph is, is the prince of Egypt and he's running, really, Egypt, there's a famine that sets in the land, but because Joseph did it God's way, he didn't just survive, he thrived. So I don't want to scare you by telling you what's coming, but I do want you to understand that it's cyclical. It happens every six to eight years. It happens over and over and over again. But that shouldn't move you if you do it God's way. Are you following me? And so I started off by apologizing because I, I know, I know, I know, I know a lot of people struggle in this area. A lot of people at the same time don't want to hear any teaching on this area. And I hope that you haven't tuned me out because, because that's why I would just jump around it and just touch it lightly. And as I was praying about this, preparing for this series, the Lord convicted me, dealt with me. And here's what he said. He said, he said, Van, um, whenever you would, you would deal with this in the past, you would find the shortest month in the year, <laughs> February. And, and you would just jump right into, this is how to do this biblically. This is how to do this biblically. And, and I said, yes, Lord, because I know that people don't really want to hear this. And God said, yes, all the teaching has been great. God says, but, but if the heart doesn't change, there won't be any lasting change. See, financial health and doing it God's way is 90% your heart and it's about 10% your head. And so it is. Thank, thank you, Damien. I'm going to say it again. It's about 90% your heart. That's what it is. It's about 90% your heart. It's about 10% your head. And that's what this series different is about. This is not about dollars and cents, but, but this entire series will be an examination of your heart before God. Because being different, thinking and behaving God's way financially, it is a matter of the heart. Now let me tell you what we've done behind the scenes. All of this is the preliminaries. I'm going to get to the passage in just a second. But this is so important. Let me tell you what we've been doing behind the scenes because of how big an issue this is. Because I know where our economy is heading. This is my business background. Because, because of this, my team and I, uh, Minister Damien, Carson, and, and, and others who work in this area, we've, we've had sit-downs with some of the, the top institutions and thinkers as it relates to finances. We, we drove to Nashville and had a sit-down with Dave Ramsey's team, uh, had long meetings with them. Uh, because I know what's coming, and I know that there are things that God has literally impressed upon me and upon the church for us to make sure that the people of God are prepared. We also had to sit down with the team from Crown Financial Ministries. Uh, and here's what we've done. What we've done with our, with our friends at Crown is we put together a free, somebody say free, free, a free survey that's on our app, that's on our website, and it's called the Money Life Indicator. I want you today, tomorrow, sometime throughout this month, because you're going to hear me talking about it all month. I want you to go out to our app, 
go out to our website, and I want you to fill out this free survey. Somebody say it's free. It's also anonymous. Somebody say anonymous. It's a financial survey. It's free. It's anonymous. We're not going to ask for your name. We're not going to ask for your, uh, any information. We're not going to ask for any information about where you are financially. You're just going to uh, really ask. We're going to ask you a series of questions. And the only reason we're doing this is because this survey is designed to measure how what you believe about money affects your behavior. That's it. It's just random questions. And the heart behind it is what this survey will yield is how what you believe about money affects your behavior. It's completely safe. It's free. It's anonymous. You're not going to have to put your name, any information. Nobody will know that, that it is you. The survey is not going to ask for your name. It's not going to ask for your phone number. It's not going to ask for your email address. Are you following me? It's free. Somebody say free. Somebody say it's anonymous. But here's why I want you to do this. Because we're going to take the survey results. And what it's going to do is it's going to help me as your lead pastor to understand where our church is overall. All of our campuses, all of the people that are part of our family. It's going to help me understand exactly where we are. And then what we're going to do with our friends from Crown and, and, and others is we're going to put together customized solutions for every part of your family, for our kids, for our youth, for our adults, regardless of where you are. If you're just getting started, if you're ready for retirement, if you're wealthy, if you're middle class, if you're still trying to scrape two pennies together, doesn't matter. We're going to put together customized solutions so that we can make sure that our entire church experience financial freedom, peace, and joy that God desires. Amen. Amen. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to come back in September, and I'm going to share the survey results with you. No names, no inf personal information will be revealed. not going to ask for it. But I'm just going to give you the high level of the survey results in September, and then we're also going to do some strategic teaching based around those survey results. And so don't do the survey now. I want you to hear uh, what thus says the Lord from the Word of God. But I want you to take, you know, it'll take 10 minutes uh, after service on your way home, and I want you to complete the survey. Online family, the link is already out there. If you don't see it, it's on our website. I want you to do that. And then for those that are struggling and on the fence about whether or not I should do it, Hey, I want you to do this. This information is so important to help us serve you better that at the end of the month, we're going to give away some free Visa gift cards uh, just as a way to bless those of you who say, you know, I really wasn't going to do it, but I could still use a Visa gift card. Uh, so, so I want that gift card. Listen, we're going to give some gift cards away. When you finish the survey, at the end of the survey, there'll be a final page that will say, thanks for completing the survey. You can print that out. Um, give it to anybody at the Welcome Center. Just write a, a contact way, a way for us to contact you on that survey, online family. You can email just that page. It says, thanks for completing the survey. You can email it to me at pass at the worship center cc org, and, and then we're, we're just going to pick some randomly, and we're just going to give away some, some gift cards, amen, just to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. amen. Come on, let's give God praise for that. But well, why do I want you to complete this survey? Because there is a connection between what you think about money and how you behave. As a matter of fact, money and how you handle it reveals the condition of your heart. That's why this whole series is not about dollars and cents. It's about the condition of your heart. I don't know if you know this, but there is an invisible uh, string that is connected from your heart to your wallet. This is why every time you get ready to have to spend something, it hurts. You're like, oh, every time you go in your, your pocket or go in your pocketbook, you're like, oh, really? I don't want to do this. Because there's an invisible line between your heart and your wallet. Why? Because how you handle money reveals so much about you. It reveals so much about your heart. It reveals so much about your priorities. It reveals so much about your loyalties, so much about your affections. This is why, as we start this series different, the very first principle that you must grasp, if your heart is going to be right before God, and if you're going to be different and do it God's way, is you got to grasp this principle. 
God must be first. God must be first. Look at somebody and tell them God must be first. Now we're ready for scripture. Go to Exodus chapter 13 and meet me at verse number one. It's on the screen. It's in the app. If you've got your Bible with you, you can turn to it very quickly. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is what? Mine. Drop down that same chapter to verse 12. It says, you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all of the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. God must be first. We cannot deal with anything else that the Bible says about stewardship without starting here. And the first thing that God wants us to understand in these principles, number one, is that the first, somebody say the first, the first must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first, the first, the first must be sacrificed or redeemed. When, when God speaks this through Moses to the nation of Israel, God is in the process of bringing the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery, and he is bringing them into a blessed land. He's pulling them out of slavery. He's setting them aside to be his people. And in addition to bringing them out of slavery, God is giving them the rules, if you will, for how to handle everything that he's getting ready to give them. He literally says, I'm bringing y'all into a land that will flow with milk and honey. You will no longer be slaves. But before you get into this land, let me tell you how you need to handle everything that I'm getting ready to give you. He gives them principles to live by. And one of these principles that God establishes from the very beginning is something called the principle of first things. And so God says this. He says, listen, the first of everything belongs to him. And specifically, he goes on and says that the firstborn either has to be sacrificed or redeemed. There is no third option. God says the firstborn of, of any animal, anything, male, female, it belongs to me. And the firstborn either has to be sacrificed or redeemed. There's no third option. There's no gray area. This is why in the verse we read a moment ago, God says, listen, if you don't sacrifice it or if you don't redeem it, he says, break its neck. Meaning, do not do anything other than sacrifice or redeem that firstborn or you're going to be in trouble. So he's telling the nation of Israel, every time you, you have your livestock has children, the firstborn of that clean animal. What is the clean animal? The clean animal is the lamb. So the firstborn of the clean animal, the lamb, has to be sacrificed. The firstborn of the unclean animals, the chief of the unclean animals at that time was the donkey. He says, if you have an unclean animal, the firstborn of the unclean animal, you have to redeem the unclean animal with a clean, spotless lamb. Are you following me? I want to make sure you get this. Here is the biblical principle. The firstborn clean animal had to be sacrificed. The firstborn of the unclean animal had to be what? Redeemed. You got it. So, when John the Baptist in the New Testament is baptizing in the Jordan River, and over the mountain comes Jesus... He's coming to be baptized by John in the, in the Jordan River. John sees Jesus coming over the horizon. What does John say? John says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why did John say that? Because John understood Jesus' role. Jesus was born clean, perfect, spotless. While we, on the other hand, were born unclean. Are you following me? So remember, 
the principle. The clean firstborn has to be sacrificed. While the unclean firstborn has to be what? Redeemed. Christ was sacrificed so that we could be what? Redeemed. Ah. This is why, this is why it breaks my heart when I hear people talking about, you know, giving and tithing and particularly the way that a lot of people approach it because a lot of people think that it is just about money. It is not about money. It is about our heart. Tithing is about God being first in our lives, but more importantly, in our heart. And this is not Pastor Van's theology. It comes directly from the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy 14 and verse 23. In Deuteronomy 14 and verse 23, it literally says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God where? First in your life. And God modeled it for us first. The quintessential scripture that I know many of you have heard is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Stop right there. He gave. Why is this important? Why, why is it important to recognize that he gave his only begotten son? Because all through scripture, here's a big point that people often overlook. Jesus was God's tithe. Jesus was God's tithe. What do you mean Jesus was God's tithe? Jesus was given first as the firstborn clean animal so that we could be redeemed. Jesus was God's tithe. Romans 8 and verse 29. Look at it. It says, for those God foreknew who he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son that he might, talking about Jesus, be the what? Firstborn. There it is. Among many brothers and sisters. He, he was God's tithe. God gave Jesus first and he sacrificed Jesus. Jesus went to the cross and died for you and I long before you and I decided to open our hearts to him. So watch this, before God had a harvest of you and I, he gave Jesus first. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans 5 and 8 that says, but God demonstrated his, his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus didn't get ready to go to the cross and say, wait, wait, wait a minute before you drive the nails in my hands. Hold on, hold on. Van, are you, are you, are you going to come to me? Are you going to give your life to me? Because if, if you're not going to do it, Van, I'm not going to go to the cross. He, 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 didn't, say, he didn't say, Minister Damien, are, are you, are you, now, uh, come on now, pinky swear that you're going to get this right because I'm getting ready to go to this cross. And I don't, you know, if you're not going to do it now, tell me because I'm not going to go through all of this. No, 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 he didn't do that. He went to the cross and gave up his life while we were yet in sin. God didn't wait to see if we were going to change first. He didn't wait to see if we were going to give our life to him. Are you following me? God gave Jesus first. That's, incidentally, what tithing is all about. It's about giving to God first and trusting him to redeem the rest. And that's what God modeled for us with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you're reading through the Bible with us as a church family, which we do every year, you recently read the story of the Exodus and how God brings the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. He sends those, those ten plagues. And that last plague, that, that tenth plague, was that the Bible says an angel of death went through and killed, watch this, all of the firstborn sons in Egypt. Are you following me? Come on, talk to me. I know this is a subject nobody wants to talk about, but... Just humble me. I mean, you know, humor me. and Just say, I, I got you, Pastor. Prayer team is already praying. Amen. All right, so, so God kills the firstborn in all of Egypt. He doesn't kill the firstborn of the Israelites. Why? Because God told Moses, you tell them to go get a lamb. Kill the lamb, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when a death angel flies over and he sees the blood, he'll pass over. Why did God have the right to kill the firstborn in Egypt? Because they belonged to him anyway. 
Why didn't he kill all of the firstborn? Because those that had the lamb slain for them, they were redeemed. It's the same principle. I, I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and they were stuck on this issue of tithing and, and, and handling God's money his way. And I asked them, I said, let me ask you something. Why do you think God created um, the tithe? And, you know, they were super spiritual and super deep. And, oh, oh, pastor, God created the tithe so that, there's, so that there's resources in the house of God. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. <laughs> and I said, well, now let me ask you this. I know, I know you heard that probably by way of tradition. I said, but, but, but think about this. I said, do you really think that the God who created the universe... Do you really think the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? The, the Bible says that he owns a cattle on a thousand hill. The, the Bible says that the silver and gold is his. I said, do you really think that, that, that God who owns everything, do you really think that God needs our money? And they couldn't give me a deep church answer at that point. And they said, well, so why did God create the tithe? He created it so that we would live by faith. That's why he created it. What do you mean? Well, when God tells the, 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 the children of Israel here in Exodus to give the firstborn to me, what is he talking about? When a firstborn lamb, when a firstborn lamb is born, it is impossible for that farmer to know how many other lambs that mother may have. But God doesn't say, let the mother produce ten and then give me the tenth and you keep the first nine. No, no, no. God says... Give me the first one. Why? Because the only way that you can give the first and not know how many others are coming is that you have to give it by faith. That's the truth about tithing. Why? Because tithing is one of the primary ways that we prove that God is first. It's one of the primary ways that we prove that God is first. Let me hurry up. The media team is like, you're running out of time. Y'all, I'm already slow. I don't know what time zone I'm on. Y'all pray for me. All right? The first must be sacrificed or redeemed. Number two, let me move quicker. The first of the first, meaning the first fruits must be given first. So the first fruits must be, the first must be sacrificed or redeemed. Number two, the first of the first. What is the first of the first? It's the first fruits. It must be given first. Let me show it to you in Exodus. Exodus 23 and verse 19. It says, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Notice God says, the first of the first fruits. He says, that's what I want. The first of the first fruits. What is the first fruits? It's, it's the first harvest. It's the first increase. It's your first paycheck. It's your first bonus. It's, it's the first. It's, it's the first of the first. It's the, incidentally, this is why we always start our year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. Because it's the first fruits. It's the very first month. God says, I want the first of the first fruits. Meaning, the last of the first fruits is unacceptable. It's not the tenth portion of the first fruits that God wants. It's the first of the first. Am I going too fast? Go back to Exodus 23 and 19 and look at that verse again. He says, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring. It's Exodus 23 and 19. We just looked at it a second ago. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring. Somebody say bring. Why doesn't God say you shall give it? Huh? That's it. You cannot give what doesn't belong to you. I could, have, I, could have, I could have given my car to Minister Damien while my wife and I were in South Africa. And I could have said, hey, would you, would you, would you take care of my car? Would you maybe uh, take it home and put it in the garage? Now, if we landed and got to church this morning and Minister Damien said, Pastor, I was praying for you. Uh, I, and, you know, the Lord put it upon my heart. Hallelujah. The Lord just really impressed upon my heart. I want to bless you, Pastor. I want to bless you with something so special. And he hands me the keys to my car. That's not a gift. 
because it belongs to me anyway. You, you'll get it on Tuesday, maybe. He says, the first of the first, bring it. Don't give it. You can't get to giving until you've fulfilled the tithing responsibility because it's his. Uh, that's another message another time. And then he says, bring it where? Into the house of the Lord. This was a big one for me to learn years ago because I used to think, well, but I'm, I'm tithing to the United Way and I'm tithing to, to my alma mater and I'm, I'm, I'm giving money here and I'm giving money there. And I've heard a lot of people say that to me, but that's not tithing. It's great to give to those organizations and we have huge missions focus as a church and give so much to so many. Uh, the work that we were doing in South Africa, I mean, we did uh, on our own dime. It wasn't we didn't go there with expecting anything. We go there, we went there to give and to pour out. And so that's great. But when God talks about the tithe and the first fruits, he says it should go to the house of the Lord, your home, your church home, the place where you are fed and developed spiritually. Amen. I got really quiet right there. Let me hurry up. Proverbs, look at Proverbs 3 and verse 9. I'm, I'm teaching this because I want you to get this. The Lord says, honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. This is a promise. God says, if you honor me by bringing me to first, that's, there it is again, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits. God says, if you put me first, God says, then all of this other stuff will work out. Your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. And you see this over and over and over and over and over again, Old and New Testament. Do you remember the story of Hannah? We tell this story every time we get ready to dedicate children. And the story in, in 1 Samuel is that Hannah wanted a baby. And, and Hannah's husband, Elkanah, uh, had two wives. It was Hannah and it was another woman named Peninnah. And Peninnah could have as many babies as she wanted. She was just blessed like that. And Hannah, uh, because in that day and time, a woman's worth was determined by virtue of her ability to have children, Hannah was depressed because she felt like her, her rival wife, Peninnah, was better than her because Peninnah could have kids and Hannah couldn't. And Hannah said, Lord, get, give me a child so, so that I can rival, in other words, Peninnah. And she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and God would not do it. And then there was a shift. She started to think and behave differently. She said, God, I'm sorry for putting myself first. She said, if you bless my womb, watch this, I will give this child to you. God blesses her womb. She has a child. His name is Samuel. She dedicates him to the Lord. He grows up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. He grows up as a priest in the Lord. Now pick me up at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife saying, may the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then she would go home and they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Do you see it? She gave Samuel to God first, and God graced her with five more children. Why? Because she gave Samuel to the Lord first. I want you to hear this. There's a grace. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. There's a grace that God wants to bring on every aspect of your life, but you have to put him first. There's a grace that God wants to put on your business. There's a grace that God wants to release so that your, your, your barns are filled and so that your vats overflow with new wine. But he has to be first. This is why in the book of Malachi, God says, test me in this. Test me. This is the only time in all of Scripture that God says you can test him. Throughout the rest of Scripture, God says, don't test me. Don't test me. But in Malachi, only on the subject of money, God says, you can test me in this. Test me. He says, try it out. This is where we get our 90-day tithing challenge from. We've been doing this 90-day tithing challenge for as long as this church has been in existence. And I've been doing it even long before God moved my wife and I here to Birmingham. And, and the outcome is the same. Every time someone puts God first, everything else is blessed. Everything else falls into place. 
I was, I was looking for a testimony that I wanted to share with you. And the Lord said, all the testimonies are the same. And I started reading through them. And they are. The testimony of every individual that ties is the same in some way, shape, or form. God has blessed me. Wow. I can't believe the Lord has done it. X, Y, and Z. But then the testimony of every person that doesn't put God first and tithe is also the exact same. I can't afford to tithe. I'm struggling. And, and, and when I get out from under, then I'll do it. But it's a cycle. In order to get out from under it, God has to be first. Because it's not about money. It's about your heart. <sighs> My daughter asked me recently as they're studying the Bible. She said, Dad... Why did God accept Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's? And I took it to this scripture in Genesis 4 and verse 3. I said, let me explain this to you. God has to be first, baby. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, let's look at this story. It says, and in the process of time, it, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the what? There it is, the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord respected Abel's offering, but he didn't respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Why didn't God receive Cain's offering? Because he couldn't. What Cain basically said is, well, I'll, I'll get around to God whenever I get around to it. And it says that in the course of time, or in the process of time, God wasn't first in Cain's heart. He just, you know, eh, here you go, God. He tipped him or gave whatever he wanted whenever he wanted to. And God couldn't accept his offering. Why? Because God can't be second. Did you hear that? Okay, let me, let me unpack this theologically. There are certain attributes about our Father. Certain attributes theologically about just the nature of God, the anatomy of God and who He is. One of them is that God cannot lie. Theologically, this is called the absolute truth of God in Scripture. Jesus says, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. Not some of the truth. God cannot lie. He is absolute truth. He's absolute truth. The other thing is God cannot change. God cannot change. Theologically, this is called the immutability of God. He can't change because if he could change, he could get better. And he doesn't need to get better because he's always the best. He's already the best. He can't change. Are you following me? Here's another thing. God cannot think like we think. Hmm? He can't think like we think. The Bible says he is omniscient. He already knows everything. God, God never wakes up and says, you know what? This just occurred to me. <laughs> no, he can't think the way we think. Because if something can occur to him, it would suggest that something hasn't occurred that will occur to him. And there's nothing that, that he does not know. It's already occurred. He sees the beginning and the end. Are you following me? Here's the last thing. He can't be second. It's called the preeminence of God. God is first. This is why even in the creation story, it says in the beginning, God. It already starts with what happens after God. Why? Because God is preeminent. God is first. Before there ever was, there was God. In the beginning, before the beginning began, God. You, you missed it. You missed it. Before there was a before, there was God. You missed it. Before the Alpha was the Alpha, there was God. God. God is the preeminent one. He's first. He cannot be second. So when, when Cain says, I just, I just give him after I take care of this and take care of this and take care of this. And yeah, I get around to him. And, and God says, I, I, I love you, son, but I can't accept that. Because it goes against the very nature of who I am. I must be first. Here's the last thing that I'll share with you. The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus 20 and verse 30 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's, and it is holy to the what? To the Lord. So just as the firstborn and the first fruits belongs to God, just as the first either has to be sacrificed or redeemed because it belongs to God, so does a tithe. And let me tell you something. One of the oldest lies of the enemy. Let me say this again. One of the oldest, oldest 
lies of the enemy, I think he came up with this in the garden, is that tithing is an Old Testament principle. It's amazing how many people hit me up on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, just nasty. If they hear it, some people, if they hear anybody say anything about what the Bible says about stewardship, they automatically label you as a prosperity guy and they just go after you. And, and, the, and the main thing that people say is, a tithe is an Old Testament principle. It's of the law. And we're people of Jesus and we are of grace. And it is so funny to me that you never hear anybody saying that murder and do not commit murder, that that's of the law. But tithing is of the law. Never hear anybody saying when God said don't commit adultery, oh, that's just of the law. It's okay now. It's okay. It's all right now because we're of Jesus. The, the truth behind those that make that argument is that they're looking for ways to make what they want first before God. That's the truth of it. And by the way, since you asked, go to Luke 11 and verse 42. Since you asked, since I know you're going to have dinner this afternoon with your cousin and him that believes that tithing is of the law, I want to show you this. I could, I'm out of time, and I can show it to you all in the New Testament, but here's a big one. Luke 11 and verse 42. This is Jesus. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, because you've given a tenth of your mint, your rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. This is one of the only things that Jesus really gives um, a, a commendation to the Pharisees and the Sadducees for. He says, in other words, yeah, y'all got the tithing thing down. Great. He says, but, but you neglected justice. You neglected the, the love of God towards people. He says, in other words, you should be doing both. He says, don't neglect the latter, but you also got to do the former. What is he saying? Keep tithing. Tithing is cool. You got that right. That's one of the only things y'all got right. But please love people too. Please be about the justice of God too. I didn't get any amens right there. Let, let me hurry up. I got, I want to show this to you. The tithe has to be first. Somebody says it has to be first. I've got 10 $100 bills. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's the tithe? Y'all so deep. How much is the tithe? 100. The question is, though, which one of these is the tithe? It's the first one. It's the first one that comes out of your hands that's spent. Um, one of the churches in South Africa, um, we just had some strong, strong moves of God. And, and like I said, we didn't go there to get anything. We went there to be a blessing and a pour out. And they were so touched by how God moved that they said, pa Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Van, we, we want to give you something. Pastor Van, please, please do not insult us. Let us give you something. And so they, 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 they all, pastors pitched in. I mean, it was like hundreds of pastors from local churches all around South Africa. And, and they, they all pitched in and they gave, they gave me a little, uh, a little love offering. Really, really little but they gave it to me in something called South African rands, which is their currency. Gave it to me in South African rands. And so we had this envelope in my backpack because my wife and I were traveling back. And, and we didn't exchange it until we got to JFK in New York. And so as we were checking out the hotel and as the bellmen and people were helping us with our bags, my wife said, um, I, I, we're out of rands. She said, uh, didn't they give you some rands? Um, did the pastors give you some rands? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, okay, I need some rands so that we can tip the bellman. She said, so where is your bag? And it was like all kinds of nuclear alarms were going off in my mind. It's like, eh, 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 eh. I said, don't touch the bag. She's like, what are you talking about? I just need some, I need some money for the bellman. I said, we haven't tithed on that yet. She said, oh, Why? Because if she would have taken that money and in, and in a good heart given it to the bellman just to help us with our bags, we would have missed the opportunity to tithe. You can still give the tenth, 10%, and not tithe. 
because it's not about money. Somebody say that with me. Say it is not about money. It's about God being first. That's what he wants. I'm going to close with this. I'm over my time. Go back to the scripture. I want to end where we started, Exodus 13, beginning at verse 14. Media team, please forgive me. I want a few hours of sleep and some Starbucks coffee, so I'm not, I'm not moving with my, my normal pep. Amen? Look at Exodus 13, and I want to go back to verse 14 where we started, basically. And God says, in the same message through Moses where he's saying, this is what you do with the first, this is why I got to be first, this is why the tithe belongs to me, it's holy. God says in Exodus 13 to 14, and in the days to come, when your sons ask you, what does this mean? He says, there's going to come a time when your children are going to come up. And they're going to say, why, why, why do we kill? Why, why are you killing the firstborn lambs? And why, why, why do we have to redeem the first, firstborn of the unclean? He says, in the days to come when your sons ask you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. He says, when your children ask you, what is this first stuff about? What is this tithe thing about? Why does God have to be first? Tell them it's because of what he did in our life. There was a time when we were slaves, there were times that we were in bondage and God brought us out. And that's why we put him first. And, and that's the message that I want you to get. This is not just about you putting God first. But the only way we're going to change the whole trajectory of your family and of generations is that it can't just be you grasp this principle. You got to pass this principle down to your children and to your children's children. That there was a day when we didn't have, there was a day when we were struggling, there was a day that we were in bondage, but everything that we have, everything that we are is because of what God has done. I, I brought my, my jug from, from home. This jug is probably about 17 years old, maybe almost 20 years I've had this. And my kids know. They see it. It sits in mom and dad's room. They see it. They sit, it sits in my room. And they always ask me, Daddy, why don't you take these coins out of, your, out of your jug and put them somewhere? I said, no, because this jug is special. Because almost 20 years ago, I was in seminary in Atlanta. And I was... So broke, I mean, I can't even say I could not pay attention. I was beyond that. I couldn't even think about paying attention. I was so broke. And I was in seminary studying the Bible, learning to be a pastor and to preach God's word. And I'll never forget one night in my one-bedroom apartment, I got down on my knees because I was going to school during the day, and I was waiting tables and bartending at night. I had a full academic scholarship but I had no money to eat. And I would scrape together my tips and I would put them in this jug. And every morning I would go in the jug and I would go to the Wendy's 99 cents menu. That's how I had breakfast. I would go back in the jug and I would pull out another $2 worth of coins and I would go to the 99 cent menu for lunch. That's how I had lunch. And I would do it all day, every day. But I was reading scripture about what God promises and what he says. And I got down on my knees and I said, God, you got to do something. Because your word says something, but I'm struggling. And I don't want to end up like, like my family who came out of nothing. And I believe that you called me to more, God. And if you don't show me what to do, I'm going to walk away from all of this. And just as I'm talking to you, the Lord said, your problem is that I'm not first. And he showed me these scriptures, and I said, but God, this is all I have. He said, it's not about money, it's about your heart. And from that very day, 
I took my first tithe out of this jar. Whatever I had, I counted it all up. And I took the tenth and I said, God, from, from now on, you will always be first. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not special, y'all. I'm, I'm not super anointed. Everything that God has done in my life, you're sitting in the manifestation of stuff. I've been around the world three and four and five times, and everything that God has done is because I put him first. He's first. He's first. And he'll do the same thing for you. It's not about money. It's about your heart. hope you enjoyed this message. For more resources, visit the worship center cc.org and vanmoody.org. You will also find Van Moody on all social media platforms. Again, we thank you for your support.